Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the next lecture in module C0452, Programming Concepts. Now in this lecture, we're going to take a look at problem solving strategies and requirements analysis. Okay, so in probably all of the lectures except this one, we're going to be taking a look at programming concepts. If you remember back to the first lecture, we had a look at the concepts of a class, creating objects of those classes, and then also the variables and the methods that we can define within our classes. Okay, and we'll go on in future lectures as well to explore even more programming concepts that we can apply. But in this lecture, which is probably going to be unique out of all the lectures that we have for this module, I want us to take a step back before we even come to implementing a solution, or in other words, coding a solution to a given problem. I want us to think about how we go about approaching that problem. Indeed, one of the most commonly asked questions that I get from students is, Nick, where do I start with this problem? You've talked to me about classes and objects, but where do I apply them and how do I do that? So in this lecture, I want us to think about how we can identify, before we even get to coding, which coding concepts that we would require and required to implement to actually solve this problem or any given problem that we might encounter. Okay, so in the, I say in this lecture, we're not going to be focusing too much upon the implementation stage, which is required to solve a problem, but first we need to figure out what we're supposed to be doing. Can we identify the problem that we're supposed to be solving? And can we pick out the concepts that we're required to use to actually design a solution for this problem? Okay, so this is a, a problem solving process that I like to use when approaching a problem, and I'll model it in the upcoming slides. First of all, I want to identify what programming concepts I'm gonna to need to use in the sentences of a particular brief. Maybe it's a problem description, or maybe I'm given a list of requirements, as indeed will be given you for this module. And so it's easier to concentrate on them one at a time. So that's what I'll do. I'll break down a problem statement one line at a time and see if we can pick out uh, some of the concepts that we're going to need to use. And then having broken down the problem into smaller problems or line by line, can we then summarize the problem? Can we then get a better understanding of what we're supposed to be doing? Okay, that's the idea. So. It can be hard when you're trying to read through a problem to actually get the main gist of the problem. You know, what is this problem about? Where do I start? So that's why I'm advocating first, break it down into its component parts. And then once we've had a deep dive through the different phrases and the different statements, different sentences in this uh, problem description or list of requirements, hopefully then, we get a better understanding of how these parts work together and what the actual problem is. Can we summarize it in a sentence? Okay. And then, of course, once you've done that, once you've got a grasp of the problem and you've identified which concepts you would need to use, then comes the next stage of actually implementing that. So you've worked out which concepts you need to use, so therefore then you have to actually write the code to be able to solve the problem. Okay, and of course there's a, a lot of different things that can go wrong in terms of the syntax there. Those, there are a lot of problems there in that domain. But what I want to do to start is actually just focus upon the preliminary stage of actually just breaking down the description and thinking about how we would actually go about solving any given problem. Okay, so we're going to take a high-level view uh, in this lecture. As I say, it's going to be probably unique from the other lecturers where we'll be uh, looking more at the syntax and the, the concepts. But here I want us to think uh, just more, more broadly and more generally and pick out which concept we would need to use here. Okay, so let's take this problem. This is a well-known problem in computing education research literature. It's been around since the 80s and has been the source of many studies since then. And it goes like this. So I'll read it out. Problem. 
Read in integers that represent daily rainfall and print out the average daily rainfall. If the input value of rainfall is less than zero, prompt the user for a new rainfall. And when you read in 99999, print out the average of the positive integers that were input other than 99999. Okay, so that's the problem statement. Imagine you were given this. Now, let's break it down bit by bit and work out if we can identify any concepts that we might be able to draw out of this and then eventually come to code them. Okay, so let's start by identifying the concepts. So we have a look at the very first phrase. Read in integers that represent daily rainfall. Okay, so we haven't technically looked at the concept of input yet and how we might do that in Java, but we can still work out that reading is an action, it's an operation. So when you see verbs doing words like get, set, print, calculate, uh, add, insert, remove, those words, hopefully you remember from the previous lecture, indicate that these are good names for methods. Remember, these are blocks of code that perform one task. Okay, so even though we haven't looked at the uh, processes, we, the statements we need to write in order to input statements into our Java programs, that will come later in the module, hopefully we can start to categorize just from looking at the words used in problems to work out, ah, this is a doing word, it's a verb, it's asking me to add, get, set, remove, print, insert, it's asking me to do something, so therefore, this lends itself to a method, okay? That's one of the concepts that we looked at previously. So can we pick out methods from reading these descriptions of problems? Okay, so we're told we need to read in integers, and their integers quite explicitly gives us the data type, doesn't it? So hopefully you remember, data types refers to variables or types of data, and in Java, we need to define our variables to be of a certain type, meaning that they store data of that type, okay? So we're probably gonna have to have a storage area that can store integer values that represent daily rainfall, okay? So we've already picked out quite a lot already from just this first half of the sentence. Uh, let's go on even more. Look at the next half of the sentence. And then we need to print out the average daily rainfall. So again, print, hopefully you're starting to see printing is a doing word, it's a verb, so therefore that lends itself to another method, okay? We can have one method for input and one method for output, all right? And then what we're printing out, we're printing out the average daily rainfall. So average is a calculation, again, a doing word, so that could be a method in itself. We could create another method uh, to calculate to basically sum up all the different rainfalls that we've entered and then divide that by the number of rainfalls that we entered. Okay, so if we say collected the rainfall for a week, seven days, then we'd add them all up and then divide by seven, the total number of days that we uh, input the data for. Okay, so already I'm seeing three potential methods that we could create, one to input the rainfall, one to then process that rainfall, calculate the average, and another one to then print it out. Okay, and that's a, a very typical pattern, by the way, for most programs, especially in this module. First, input data, and then do something with it, calculate it, modify it, process it in some way, and then usually output it to the screen so that we can see it. Okay, so input, calculation, output. Very typical process for our programs. Okay, let's move on. Next sentence, okay, if the input value of rainfall is less than zero, prompt the user for a new rainfall. Okay, so the very first word here I wanna focus on is if, okay? We haven't yet looked at if statements, we're gonna do that in the next lecture, but again, hopefully, just applying some logic here, conditionality, well, we're probably gonna have to write a piece of code to respond to this condition. So if the input is less than zero, 
There's our condition, by the way. Uh, that's what we want to respond to. The value entered, input, is less than zero. If that happens, then do something. So then, if that is the case, if our input is less than zero, prompt the user. So prompt um, is another word for output. So it's prompting the user. It's asking them something. You know, it's, it's print out a message to ask the user to enter something or give something to the program. So when you see prompt, think of output. I want to have an output statement. And we want to ask the user for a new input. OK, so if we decoded the method uh, above for input, potentially we could call that again here. OK, so that's what's happening there. And then the final sentence, when you read in a particular value, in this case, 99999, print out the average. OK, so when, does that imply conditionality? When something happens, do something. OK, so if, when, when you see those two words, or words similar to them, think that's probably going to be selection. Select is another word, by the way, you, you might see. Select something, select this. Um, when you see words like that, think conditionality. Okay, I'm going to have to write code to respond to an event or to a condition, something happening. And again, you notice here it's referring to values being input or read in. So when the value entered is 99999, do something. Yeah, so in this case, print out. And again, print, verb, do something, printing out, so method. And again, if in the uh, first sentence we'd coded the method to print out the average daily rainfall, then we could probably just call that there. Okay, assuming, of course, we uh, protected the inputs from negative values, because if we decoded the previous sentence, then uh, we would have protected the input from negative values being entered. So hopefully we'd only have positive values being entered. Okay, so that is a very first step to thinking about identifying concepts that we could use here. OK, certainly not the, the full process. We've then got to come and actually code those concepts and work out how we do that. And as I said, there's lots of problems that can occur with syntax. But first of all, we're thinking about the problem, working out how we go about doing it. Imagine a, a tradesman with a toolbox. You know, a tradesman has lots of different tools in his toolbox. Uh, he might have a hammer, a uh, drill, uh, pliers, um, all kinds of different tools, and he has to work out which tool is going to be most appropriate for the particular job he needs to perform. So think of programming concepts like that. You've got a toolbox for the concepts. You need to work out which one you're going to apply. And the key is in identifying keywords, as I said, like read, print, uh, set, get. If you can pick out those words that perform actions or operations, they're going to be methods. And likewise, if you find nouns that refer to characteristics or names of variables, then those will be variables. OK? Let's move on. So now that we've broken down those three sentences, we took it a line at a time, can we now pick out the main problem here? OK, which one of these three sentences best describes the problem or the main objective of this? Now, I would say it's the first one. The reason why the giveaways are in the final two sentences, so if and when. Those are conditions. They certainly refer to the main objective of the program, which is all to do with rainfall, entering it and processing it. And these are the conditions for which the data, the data input should be processed. So protecting against negative values. Obviously, we can't have minus figures for rainfall unless we see rain um, you know, evaporating, maybe. But uh, rainfall is in you know, rain coming down from clouds. Uh, it's going to be positive in terms of its amount. And likewise, protect against the final value, which in this case is an extraordinarily large uh, number. I think to separate from uh, accurate values, um, unless we've got flooding conditions or something, that we can have a colossal number. But here, I think that's what it's referring to. 99999 is a way to stop the input so that we can then 
output the final average. Okay, so these are just conditions regarding the input, but the input is summarized in the first sentence. Read in integers that represent the rainfall, then process them, calculate the average of all of the numbers input, and then finally output them, print them out to screen. So that sentence gives us the main objective. So I would suggest, as we see here, these, uh, the final two sentences are conditional. So therefore, I would suggest we first concentrate upon the first sentence and then implementing that. Okay, so this is where we might then transition from our thinking about the problem to coming to actually writing the code to go about solving the problem. Now, as I say, I'm not going to do that in this lecture. That will come later. We'll give you plenty of demonstrations how to do that. We're just staying at the high level, thinking how we can first approach a problem. Okay, so that's what I recommend, implementing the core functionality first. And if you want to, feel free to separate parts of sentences from descriptions and uh, problem scenarios. If you want to, we're going to give you these uh, in this format. So we can give you a, a list of uh, different uh, functions and different conditions to implement. And uh, if you want to, you could separate that first sentence into separate points, and uh, maybe even the second a statement here, again, into uh, a net three points if you want to. You can have one for reading in for the input, another for calculating the average, and then the third one could be printing it out. Here, they're joined together in the second one, but if you want to, as I say, you could separate them further for further breakdown. Okay? And then once you have implemented that core functionality, that's then the point to extend it with coding the conditions, coding the extras, the um, parts to extend the core functionality, or at least give more validation and meaning to that core functionality. Okay, I mean, technically you could start with the conditionality, uh, coding the statements here for this, uh, the three and the four uh, list points here, but uh, our recommendation would be to get a working program first. Okay, it's much easier when you've got something working to then change it. Um, if you're struggling to get something working, that's going to be frustrating, and you could spend a lot of time trying to fix that and then miss out on the core functionality. Okay, so that's our recommendation uh, throughout the module. Is first implement the core con the core functionality, get that working first, and then extend it. Okay, so. Don't worry, don't panic. You don't have to do anything like that for this week. This is just an example of a description of a problem and how you might go about you know, deciphering and translating the words written in the sentences in English and picking out what those might mean in terms of programming. And again, it's very high level. We're just identifying, is this a method? Is this a variable? Is this a class? Is this an object? Um, so, what I want to do now is show you uh, an example of a problem that we gave to our students last year. And uh, let's start with the description of the problem. And we'll have a look at a, another uh, problem solving strategy that you can employ here. Because what we did is we gave students a starting project which had the classes given to them for this particular scenario. But what I want to do here is I want us to read this description and think about, can we identify any entities here? Remember in the first lecture, the previous lecture, we talked about classes as representing entities. I used the description of a house, and we could have a house class from which we can instantiate multiple objects from that. Okay, we can have one representing a semi-detached house, another object representing a mansion, another one representing a cottage or a bungalow. Okay, we can code a generic house class or an entity and then create specific objects of that with unique values. So one of the core thinking skills here with coming to program is can we pick out classes and objects from reading through a description of a problem. So let's read it. 
So this app is a simple simulation of a ticket machine where a user can enter real money as coins and is able to purchase tickets. And then it goes on to say, edit your copy of the project to offer tickets to free local stations. And here we've got some examples. Aylesbury, Amersham and High Wycombe, okay, which are train stations uh, in the surrounding area. Okay, so can we pick out any entities from this statement? And to help you out, some f another tip that you can use is to look for groups of related items. So we, we've got here the suggestion that we should have free tickets, or at least free stations that we have tickets to. So what do these all share in common? Well, they're all tickets. So possibly, and I strongly suggest, that we have a ticket class from which we can create ticket objects from. Ticket is the generic entity, and then we have specific ticket objects, Aylesbury, one to Amersham, and another one to High Wycombe. And those have attributes. So they have a name, you know, the name of the location where they're going to, the station, and a price, okay? So that's one of the entities that we can pick out here. Okay, so if, even if you can't identify which one of the words is the more generic, have a look for specific examples of a group of items. So here the group of items are tickets. So therefore, if you've got a group of tickets, we can probably we can have a ticket class to model the objects of that entity. The other, and then the other two are a bit more subtle uh, because the other two are coins and ticket machine. So coins, okay, with this example, we've got a price. Again, these all share in common. Uh, tickets all cost money. So therefore, we could have a coin type. We actually go on to model it as an enumerate type, which we're going to come to in the next lecture. But we could have a coin structure to then model specific instances of coins, like 10p or 20p or a pound or two pounds, okay? Um, so therefore we have a group of coins, so therefore we can have a entity referring to coins. And then finally, the final one is the ticket machine itself. So uh, in the actual program, there was probably only one object of the ticket machine, but again, thinking on uh, gen general terms, if in a station you could have multiple ticket machines located around the station, that lends itself to a group of objects, a group of related items, ticket machines, so therefore we can have a ticket machine class. And indeed, in this case, the ticket machine class is responsible for allocating the tickets, removing the tickets, processing the tickets, printing out tickets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it manages all the different uh, behaviors and operations there. Okay, so as I say, you haven't been given the code for this, but I'm hoping you can start to employ some thinking skills and identify the classes before you even see them. Okay, because indeed, these were the classes that we gave the students. Ticket class, coins, enumerate type, and the ticket machine class itself. Okay. Now let's take a look at some requirements that we gave to students. So again, coming back to what we started with, we're going to take each requirement line by line and see if we can pull out some of the concepts we might need to employ to code and solve this problem. So first requirements. Each ticket should have a destination, a cost, and a date purchased. Now, you saw the examples in the previous slide of Aylesbury, Amersham, and High Wycombe. And if that wasn't enough to convince you that this should be built as a class, ticket class, from which you can create objects for Amersham, for High Wycombe, and for Aylesbury, hopefully this statement here will seal the deal because we've got here nouns, haven't we? We've got names of things, a destination, a cost, a date purchased, and guess what? They belong to the ticket. Each ticket should have a destination, a cost, and a date purchased. So these are characteristics, these are attributes of each ticket. So therefore, 
like we saw in the previous lecture, the first lecture, these can be modeled as variables of the ticket class. Okay, so hopefully those are giveaways there to say that we need a ticket class and we need to build it with the capacity to have attributes for destination, cost, and date purchased. From which when we instantiate an, the class as an object, one for, Ail one for Aylesbury, one for Amersham, one for High Wycombe, we can then give specific values for each of those objects, referring to these attributes. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Print, first word. What is printing? It's a doing word. So hopefully that's a verb, we, we see that, so hopefully that tells us that this lends itself to a method. Okay, so create a method which will print out all of the available tickets. Tickets, again, group and a collection of objects, so therefore, again, further cementing that tickets can be built as objects of a ticket class. Okay, and then finally, Last one is select one of the tickets to purchase. So again, keyword here, select implies conditionality. It could be this one, it could be that one, it could be that one, it could be that one. Select between them. So we're probably gonna have an element of conditionality here to select one of our ticket objects. Okay, so I'm hoping these examples here have started to get you thinking about how you can translate your problem statements, any descriptions, any requirements that you're given during this module, or any module, in fact, and break them down and identify the concepts first. Is this a method? Is it a variable? So if it's a doing word, printing, adding, setting, getting, inserting, removing, doing something, it's probably gonna be a method. If it's a characteristic, an attribute, it's probably gonna lend itself to a variable of a class. And remember, that's the two parts of a class. We've got variables at the top and then methods, okay? And then finally, you know, with entities, if you can pick out a group of related items, whether that's houses, tickets, students, any type of collection of entities, that lends itself to defining a class, the generic entity, what they all share in common, and then specifying those attributes, those variables, as well as methods within the class. And then you can create objects of those classes and then give them unique values. Okay, so we haven't actually looked at the coding of this yet, but remember, this is just the first step. It's just getting you to identify which one of those tools in your toolbox that you need to apply to go about solving a problem. So. I hope that was helpful. I'll see you in the next lecture.